Any research, particularly when it is for the production of a documentary on the artistic dimensions of a subject, requires numerous resources. While studying these various resources, the researcher is automatically catapulted into looking into the foundation, the roots of the particular subject matter. The more one tries to separate the history and ideological aspects of the research, the greater the necessity to probe into the background of the subject. This documentary, Studying History, is an attempt to become acquainted with the background of a group of Canadian citizens, their religious beliefs, and their pursuit of art and their creation of artistic works. Those men and women having made the most difficult decision of their lives, immigration, chose another territory for living. They are experiencing a glorious gift from God, and that is freedom. They have the freedom to live where they want and in a way in which they like. After Prophet Muhammad's demise, a government remained which, having triumph over the great powers of the era, developed into a great empire in the course of about two centuries, the boundaries of which reached China on the east and North Africa on the west. The management of such a grandiose territory required the development of administrative and financial systems and most importantly, the extension of roads and the constructions of new buildings. This state, through its interaction with new territories, learned new administrative, political, financial, and artistic ways of thinking from the conquered territories of the Persian Empire and the Roman empires. This entity was able to manage the territories under its reign for over six centuries. One of the most important evolutions in this era was the creation of a new art, which was the product of economic flourishing and social development. The art had a vivid impact on philosophy and had a unique characteristic that made it distinct from the classic art of the era. Although this was not the first time that philosophy displayed its effect on art, yet prior to this time, the art, architecture in particular, had never been influenced by philosophy so conspicuously. The two principal elements in architecture which have remained from the era are demonstrative of a philosophical outlook on art embodied in light and color. Muslims believe that light is the origin of the knowledge of humanity and its surrounding environment and its ultimate source is God. Light is the illuminator and the creator of life. Just as the creator of life, God donated life and living to human beings. Although in this divine philosophy, it is a sin to perceive God to resemble any subject whatsoever. And in principle, God is beyond perception and materialization. Yet light is the only comprehensible reflection for human beings of God's nature and existence. The Quran says in explicit terms that God is the light of the skies and the earth. Also in the Quran, it further says that Moses on Mount Sinai spoke to a light that was the epiphany of God. In Islamic architecture, the idea of applying design, material, and geometry crystallizes into a shape that reflects the most salient of revelatory manifestation of God, i.e. light. The other element is color. Color is also given a dear position. Color is the symbol and illustration of the unity of the whole existence, despite its multitudinous. In contrast to the light, which is the manifestation of God, color is the symbol of the material world. Color is visible only with light 
which is the manifestation of God, and color in its entirety depends on light, just in the same way that a human being is made of material, is created by God, and its life is unperceivable without the luminosity of God's light. The main difference between Islamic architecture and Christian architecture traces back to a principle in each of these two religions. Under Islamic theology, God has not been born nor has given birth to any child, and his incarnation by a human is a mortal sin. For God is beyond a human's perception. Consequently, no sculpture that would be the embodiment of God may be seen in any Islamic center or mosque. In the Christians' places of worship, and according to many branches of that religion, both God and his Son, the Messiah, are worshipped, and hence their sculptures are on display in churches. By the same token, the functions of light and color differ in these two religions. Under Islamic theology, light is only the epiphany of God and gives life to color, which represents the material world, and color is not visible without light. Under the Christian theology, however, the only function of light is to illuminate a sculpture that symbolizes God. The crescent design is one of the unique signs in Islamic architecture. It can be attributed to Muslims wherever it is seen. The crescent design shown on certain Islamic countries' national flags is illustrative of the importance that Muslims place on the symbol. This is symbolic of the name of the organization, the Red Crescent Society, which is in Islamic countries. It serves the same function as the Red Cross Society does in mainly Christian countries. The Muslims see the rise of the crescent as the sign of nightly worship, a worship that begins at midnight and ends prior to morning prayer. They consider this worship to be a great virtue and the best occasion to supplicate God. The curve existing in architectural lines, which is the typical pattern in all worship places of Muslims, could have well been taken from the crescent. Domes and mihrabs, which are the two main constituents of a mosque all over the world, are examples of the similarity and the crossing of curved lines in buildings with Islamic architecture. Mihrab is an Arabic word meaning feel of battle. Muslims believe that the most critical struggle for a human being during his worldly life is against Satan. And if a human being does not succumb to satanic desires and temptations, he will be placed among the good slaves of God. His sins will be absolved by the Almighty and he will be given a place in God's beautiful paradise. Symbolically, the mihrab, which is always an integral part of a mosque, is the feel of this battle and fight. It is based on this philosophical inference that the mihrab is considered to be an important element of interior decoration of mosque. There also is a mambar in every mosque, but it is not a main constituent of Islamic architecture. The manbar is a special pulpit on which the imam or a religious preacher sits on to deliver sermons to the people. The manbar is high above the ground, allowing the audience to see the preacher and to hear his voice. The foregoing characteristics of Islamic architecture, which are influenced by Islamic divine philosophy, theology, 
are common in both the main religious branches of Muslims, the Shias and Sunnis. However, each of these two groupings have special components in their worship places. The differences are not very visible for non-Muslims. The appearance of special characteristics, in general, can be traced back to the beginning of Islamic history. These two branches have different versions of the basis for the legitimacy of Islamic government. Shias, as an influential sect within the Muslim society, believe that after the demise of the Prophet Muhammad, a number of imams in sequence were selected for taking charge of the Islamic government. These imams, whom the then emirs, khalifs, generally imprisoned or banished, were basically barred from communicating with the Muslims, the imams, all of whom, with the exception of the twelfth, were martyred, were righteous and competent leaders whom the rulers, for the most part, kept out of the government. The Shia believe that the twelfth imam named Mahdi will reappear together with Jesus and that he, assisted by an army of 313 soldiers, many of whom will be Christians, will enter into a fight against the oppressors and will defeat them with God's help. He will then establish and propagate justice and equity all over the world. This belief in legitimacy of the government of the righteous and competent imams is illustrated in the architecture of many Shia mosques in a variety of forms. For example, the construction of 12 columns or 12 windows is symbolic of the existence of the 12 imams. In certain Shia mosques, it is quite obvious the impact of Shia political philosophy on architecture. Canada is the farthest northern country on the American continent. Its 8,045 kilometer frontier with the United States of America constitutes the longest border with no frontier guard in the world. Canada is the largest immigrant accepting country in the world. Since about a century ago, it adopted a policy of immigration in order to preserve its population equilibrium. Immigrants chose this country for living willingly and interestedly in place of the United States, in which slavery was the order of the day. In a census taken in the year of 1881, only 13 Canadian citizens, no accurate information regarding whose country of origin is available, introduced themselves as Muslims. From the year of Canada's independence, 1867 until 1968, the Canadian immigration policy was founded on giving special privilege to European immigrants. Early in 1968, however, after this privilege had been removed, several groups of immigrants from Islamic countries, mainly from the Indian Peninsula, immigrated to Canada. Although immigration of the first Muslims to Canada dates back to about a century prior to that time. There are several stories regarding the emigration of the first Muslim immigrants to Canada, but most of them can't be verified due to a lack of documentary evidence. For example, in some of these stories, the names of a number of people are mentioned who had introduced themselves as Muslims without having Islamic names. One story relates to one Ms. Angel Law, who immigrated to Canada in the year of 1854 and resided in York or Toronto, Ontario, or a young couple named Marta and John, 
who immigrated to Canada in the year 1871. The most authentic story concerning the first Muslims who moved to Canada is that pertaining to a village in Lebanon named La La. The immigration of several families from that village to Canada resulted in the acquaintance of other villagers with Canada, and it also resulted in the new territory's acquaintance with Lebanon and Syria, and later on the Middle East itself. Prior to this date, the first immigrant group who moved from the Middle East to North America and Canada were the Armenians from the Ottoman Empire. The Armenians formed a minority and were under pressure from the Ottomans, who were accusing them of espionage in favor of aliens. That pressure engendered their organized immigration to the West, and particularly to the United States and Canada. Those who immigrated to the West in the last decades of the 19th century helped Muslims in Syria and Lebanon, as well as parts of the Ottoman Empire, become familiarized with Canada. The story of Ali Abu Chadi, or Alex Hamilton, who is one of the most famous Muslims throughout the history of Canada, is one of the most exciting accounts of this group of immigrants. Ali was from the Lala village in Lebanon. Having traveled some 50 kilometers and being accompanied by his uncle, he moved to Beirut, where from they took a several thousand kilometers voyage to Montreal in order to have their dreams come true in the Klondike mines. Although he did not find much success in this area, Consequently, he became one of the most well-known citizens of Montreal. One of the most notable characteristics of Canada, which is very remarkable, unique in the contemporary era, is the highest degree of religious tolerance and the lack of racism. This is attractive to some Muslims in laic or secular countries, such as Turkey and Tunisia. For many, they are able to perform their rites and rituals with a freedom that they don't have in their own countries. One of the manifestations of this religious indulgence is the construction of mosques and the formation of Islamic architecture in the great cities of Canada particularly in Toronto. As the Muslim population increased in Canada, immigrants embarked on constructing mosques for performing their rituals and teaching their religion to the new generation. The first mosque in Canada and North America was constructed in the city of Edmonton. This mosque, named Al-Rashid, was inaugurated thanks to the efforts undertaken by a group of Muslim women in the year 1938. The old Al-Rashid Mosque had been built in the center of the city of Edmonton. This mosque was constructed by a Ukrainian architect named Mike Drought, who had never seen a mosque in his life. Consequently, this mosque had no resemblance at all to the mosque with Islamic architectural characteristics. In the year 1982, the old Al-Rashid Mosque, situated in the compound of the Royal Alexander Hospital, became part of the site of a plan for development of the hospital's parking space and faced the risk of destruction. Thanks to the cooperation extended by the Edmonton municipality, however, it was moved to Fort Edmonton Park, and nowadays it is being used as an Islamic museum. Years after the old Al-Rashid Mosque had been destroyed, a new Al-Rashid Mosque was constructed. 
this mosque was inaugurated on May the 28th, 1992. Unlike the old mosque, the new Al-Rashid Mosque is one of the most notable examples of Islamic architectural buildings in Canada. The design of Al-Rashid Mosque incorporates the main elements of mosque architecture in North Africa. The single minaret dome with broad base and the crossing lines existing in the building bring the distinct configuration of Islamic architectural elements in Egypt and Algeria into mind. In this architecture, the chapel, or the main part of the mosque, is illustrated with square figures in courtyard and circles on the ceiling formed symmetrically. The Al-Rashid Mosque is the heritage of the oldest mosque in Canada, but certainly it is not the most beautiful Islamic building in this country. You should pay a visit to Calgary to see one of the most splendid examples of Islamic architecture in Canada. Beitul Nur Mosque has been constructed in this city. Beitul Nur is an Arabic phrase meaning the house of light. At first glance, every observer will be amazed that the architects of this building constructed it elegantly and intelligently on an elevated site in the middle of the city and on its margin. The vast area surrounding the mosque makes it even more attractive. The curvature of the dome alongside the cloister at the entrance of the mosque and its silvery brilliance undoubtedly make this architectural work equivalent to the most beautiful classic buildings of the city. The green belt around the mosque, the creation of which is inspired by the Quran description of paradise, has fascinatingly encompassed the mosque. According to Muslims, paradise is a large and beautiful garden in which pious people will have eternal life at the order of God. This dazzling description has caused Islamic architects to cover the mosque's surrounding spaces by greenery. The Beit al-Nur Mosque Chapel's window also opens to a green space, which creates a very pleasant ambience during the hot season. After Alberta, we move towards Ontario. There are a number of older Canadian mosques in Toronto. The Medina Mosque in downtown and the Jaffari Mosque in North York are the oldest mosques of the city. The old Jaffari Mosque, also known as Bayview Mosque, was constructed by the Khoja Society of Muslims. Because Muslims did not have a good financial condition in the 1960s and 70s, they were not able to adhere to the aesthetics criteria of Islamic architecture. The new Jafari Mosque was constructed in Tornhill in the year 2010. It may be rightly stated that this mosque is the most beautiful example of Islamic architecture in Canada. The Jafari Mosque, which is also the last mosque built in Canada, has unique characteristics which has made it unique to the Shia branch. Owing to their own special version of history, Shias believe in a savior who would emerge at the end of this world's life and keep themselves always prepared for the occurrence of this great event. Religious rites in this Islamic section are founded on the occurrence of historical events, such as the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad. This martyrdom symbolizes the uprising of the saints against oppressors. Every year, Shias convene great gatherings on the occasion of the martyrdom anniversary for commemorating this event. 
The Jafari Mosque has many chapels with removable walls, which provide enough space for religious occasions by lifting such walls. The large openings in the hall's ceilings put on exhibit the advanced techniques of distributing weight in a relatively vast area without any pillar. Although nowadays a bouquet like a minaret top has lost its function at a place from which times of prayers were announced to Muslims, yet it has kept its symbolic function in composition of mosque. The Jafari Mosque also has a high bouquet like minaret top. The largest Islamic centers of Canada are located in Ontario. The most important underlying reason for the accumulation of Muslims in Ontario and the city of Toronto is the existence of a better labor market when compared to the other states. Torontonian Muslims, thanks to their better financial capabilities, have built up beautiful mosques in this city. One of these structures, which has implemented Islamic architecture, is the Beit al-Islam Mosque in Maypole. This mosque has been designed and constructed by a group of engineers. There are other exquisite examples of Islamic architecture in Canada. Among them, one may mention is the Imam Hussein Mosque in Toronto, the Jame Friday Mosque in Ottawa, and the Isna Mosque in Mississauga. Art, architecture in particular, reaches its apex when the artist creates the art with freedom of thinking. Muslims in Canada are trying to demonstrate their peace-loving and progressive character, notwithstanding the things imputed to them in certain media. Art is the common language even for those who do not know each other's language. For the Lord has embedded in all human beings the sense of understanding and the ability to enjoy beauty. It is for this reason that art is equally beautiful when implemented in the construction of all places of worship, such as mosques, churches, and synagogues.